call the March 5th uh, school committee meeting to order. Uh, before I go through tonight, uh, I'd like to apologize to the to the uh, Joshua Eaton community. I know you were all here waiting the other night, uh, and I, I sincerely apologize that that went uh, so long. And and uh, happy that you were able to come out tonight. So thank you for that. So uh, tonight we'll have public input uh, and the consent agenda. I'm going to uh, save reports until the end so mm -hmm. that we can uh, go right into the Josh Wheaton presentation so you can get home a little earlier tonight. <laughs> and then uh, we'll uh, do the, after that, the personnel report and the, and the quarterly budget review and the... Uh, did we have the, uh, we had something, education a special policy. education report? Or, no, that was yeah. last time. Yeah, that's right. And, and then we'll, uh, that's it. That's so, it. Uh, there will so, be no executive session. Right, right. Uh, and is there any public input for anything that's not on the agenda? Yes. Yeah. I'm to talk about kindergarten. I apologize. <laughs> Joshua, sure. It'll be really brief. So I just wanted to come here tonight as a incoming kindergarten parent whose son will be going to full day kindergarten next year. And I feel like watching the school committee meeting last time, maybe that voice wasn't there as much as the other voice was. And um, I, for one, and many of my other friends who are also sending their children to full day last year were actually pleased when we got our letters from the superintendent stating um, what the plan was. And I think that's because it fulfilled three parameters that I ask all of you to keep in mind when you are figuring out what, what's going to go on next year. And the first, I think there's something that doesn't have to do with this year, is that full day kindergarten was offered to everyone who wanted it. And in some forums right now, that's being looked at as negative. And in my mind, that's such a step backwards. Um, the portion of education now is for full-day kindergarten. In the nation, it's for full-day kindergarten. And certainly in Massachusetts, it's for full-day kindergarten for, for all students who, in some cases, all students, and certainly for all students who want it. And to take that away in Reading would be hugely negative and I really think the diminished reputation of the school system among educators, among young families looking to get into the community, and um, among this other school districts in general. So I was very pleased this year and I appreciate the superintendent's um, commitment to provide that full day kindergarten for everyone who wanted it this year. And the second is that it did keep class sizes at a reasonable level. I would be very scared for next year if my five-year-old is going to be with 24, 25 other kids. And that doesn't seem to be the case with this current model, which is great. And third, and this is kind of is third on my list, is that it is dedicated classrooms. This is my first experience with running public schools, but anecdotally, I've heard that the integrated model just did not work for a lot of people. So I know a lot of people who heard these rumors that, you know, integrated classrooms really are not the way to go were very happy seeing that everything was dedicated. Um, and so I just want to um, push for when you are deciding what to do next year. I know there's a lot of emotional appeals and I that's going to be, it's hard doing multiple drop-offs, I have, I understand that, but really you as a committee, your job is to do what's best educationally for these kids. And I don't think anyone can argue is that keeping class size low, number one, is extremely important, and also number two, keeping things integrated is best, I mean, um, keeping things in dedicated classrooms is best for everyone, full day and half day kids. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to Great. say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so gonna, sorry. My name is Melissa Cataldo. I also wrote an email, I think, which is yeah. mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi. Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I'm here again to ask why you've not held a hearing on Nick Boyben's proposal to restore the elementary and middle school teachers in the fiscal year 19 balanced budget. I got no response when I asked at the hearing last week, and I was wondering if you could please tell me why you will not hold a hearing on a proposal that makes sense for our schools. If the override passes, then we will not have lost teachers to other districts, and we will be on track to make the override money last longer. And if the override fails and we were on track to have a backup plan that saves middle school foreign language and English teachers and does right by our students could I get an answer so uh, you know it wasn't out of disrespect that we didn't answer last time but uh, I, I think uh, you had sent an email too and we did uh, we spoke for, we met we deliberated the budgets for over oh, oh, for the the alternative proposals for over an hour if you go back and look at the tape and the committee voted uh, the budget and it's not felt at this time that we want to reopen uh, the balance budget we, we move forward with what we already voted but I was just disturbed that one of the reasons why the proposal didn't go forward was uh, that was given at the meeting, at the initial meeting when it was voted on was that there was no time to hear from athletic parents. So if you held a hearing, you could hear from all stakeholders and then make a fair deliberation. So we're also uh, uh, guided by the charter and we had to have a a balanced budget to the town manager <coughs> by a certain time frame which we met uh, and uh, which was uh, February or, or excuse me January you actually yeah, it was, it was January. yep um, uh, and uh, so you know when we start we just we were outside of that window we have to follow the charter and the committee voted a budget within the guidelines of the charter and we just can't have another but isn't the uh, budget just a number and can't you move money from one cost center to another like what happened last june I mean, what, what do you mean? I mean we vote a, a uh, bottom line but with the understanding that it's going to be spent uh, in the areas that were presented to us uh, we, what do you mean by move, mo move money? I thought that as long as the final budget number remained the same, that if you wanted to, you could dedicate more money to save the teachers and maybe um, trim elsewhere in the budget so it wouldn't uh, eliminate middle school foreign language and the extra English block that is so important, for, especially for special education students. Thank you. I would appreciate it if we can discuss this further offline, but please, okay. why not just a hearing? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other public comment? Thank you. Uh, the consent agenda. Uh, let's um, read a motion. Yep, and move to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Mrs. Uh, second. So who's going to second? So Mr. Bobby wanted to pull some. I just had some quick questions about three of the items, so I'm going to move to remove them from the consent agenda and then quickly dispatch of my questions on them. So the, the following I would move to remove from the consent, the consent agenda, acceptance of the anonymous donation, the first one, acceptance of donation from the Reading Education Foundation, and acceptance of the donation to Birch Meadow. I have three routine questions on those, but what's left is the Wood End School, which I find with leaving the consent agenda. Okay. So let's uh, vote on the consent agenda as amended. All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Uh, you want to ask sure. Just I'll do the second and third one first, just very quickly. Um, I, I didn't see in the packet, and maybe it's just the packet I, I have, but the uh, donation to the Reading Educational Foundation and the donation to Birch Meadow, typically there's a letter, if it's not an anonymous donation, attached with the memo from the superintendent. I didn't see those in the packet. I, I'm fine with accepting these these donations. I just, in a subsequent packet, my request would be that we could include any, any letter from the source of, of that. I think Arbella for the Birch Meadow and Reading Educational Foundation is self-explanatory. 
Did I miss it in the packet that I had? No, no, no. Okay, just shuffling paper. Well, there's one for Wood End, and then there's another one for... For Burton. No, no, those are the memos from the superintendent. Yeah. What I want is the letter from the source... From the donor? From the donor, well, just for the public record to be complete, that's all. Can we get those ones in the next? Can we just fill those in in the next packet? I'm, I'm happy to vote for these. I just wanted to have the documentation consistent. Okay, so it's just a procedural question. So we'll add those to the... With the next packet, next packet. And it's consent agenda then. Yeah, and, and then on the anonymous donations, just a quick question for the superintendent. For me, on, on anonymous donations, I just typically ask for confirmation that we uh, there were no other strings attached, that there, there were no other. It looks it looks like they're unrestricted yeah. funds, I and I just want to confirm that, that. There, there are no strings attached. The only stipulation was that it goes towards the middle school social emotional learning. Other than that, there were no strings attached. Thank you. I'm ready to vote. Without so, the backup. So yeah, no, let I'm, it be I'm, included in the next package? Yeah, no. included okay. too. Well, the, the anonymous donation I can accept right now. I so would I have a motion to just... Yep, move to accept the anonymous donation given the additional information provided by Mrs. Dowd. Uh, second. Second. Oh. All those in favor? Six zero. And do we want to move the other two to the next packet? Yeah, the, okay. when you, with the when the backup material in the next, they'll go in the next consent agenda. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so yeah. Just, uh, no, I think just as always, the committee thanks all the donors that come yes. and for for their donations, <coughs> and we appreciate it and recognize that most of the organizations that are actually receiving donations then also thank those donors and acknowledge those donors. So the committee here, we just do that as part of our consent agenda. But um, I believe at some one or two, twice a year, we review all of that as part of our budget process and um, are deeply appreciative of all the, adi of the additional donations that come into the district to support our students. And the, uh, just, just to highlight, just this anonymous donation of 12000 for the middle school it is really spectacular and, and much appreciated and very substantial. So thank you to whoever you are. Thank you. Mrs. Hippolito. If possible, we're going to hold the questions until the end of the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me back this evening. I'm excited to present everything Joshua Eaton. Um, I first want to recognize uh, my staff members who have come out this evening. Um, not only they dedicated, you know, between the hours of 8, 10, 3, 10, but literally 24-7. So, um, first is Jamie Quinn, who is a second grade teacher, is also my vice principal. Marie Kiley, grade two. Susie Libby, grade two. Michelle Callen, grade four. Ann Nina, kindergarten. DJ Cook, grade three. Phyllis Green, bridge three. And Brittany Kurtz, um, learning center teacher. So thank you for being here as well. Okay, so I'm gonna review um, some of the information we previewed during um, the October presentation, but we've continued to make um, strides towards our goal and so I'll just do some updates. So the first school improvement goal is around continuing to improve student performance in ELA with full implementation of Readers Writers Workshop. So some of the action steps that we have taken is um, looking first at the materials that our staff has to make sure they have the right materials in order to um, teach the less lessons um, to efficacy. And what we did find was that our special education department um, didn't have all the materials. So, so thanks to central office, we were able to purchase those materials um, so that every teacher has their own um, teacher guides for our readers, writers workshop model. We continue to work on unpacking the different lessons um, to really make the connections between the Massachusetts curriculum standards <coughs> and the lessons that are put forth through the Lucy Coggins Readers and Writers Workshop. Um, the teachers continue to work together, both special ed and regular ed, to collaborate so that we're reaching the needs of all of our learners. Um, let's see. We um, This year, we've moved towards um, assessing three different areas um, in the area of written language, which are narrative, opinion, and informational writing, um, and in higher grades persuasive uh, writing. And so um, 
we've been collecting that data and looking and really using the rubrics that come with the program to look at students' growth over time in many different areas around uh, written literacy. Uh, we use the benchmark assessments, uh, the third edition, to track <coughs> our progress, and I'll be sharing some of that exciting um, data with you shortly. Um, We've been doing work. We've dedicated all of our staff meetings this year to literacy. So we've done um, everything from reviewing to make sure that we're implementing the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment system um, consistently among every grade and every teacher. So we've done a lot of work um, around that. We've also looked at the ELA standards and we're taking one domain at a time and really unpacking it and taking it apart and to say, what are the sub-skills of these standards and what does that look like vertically? And so as a team, we've created a document that we've shared K through five so that every teacher has this document so they're, we're able to see like, where have the students been? Where are we going this year? And where are we going in the future? And that's been really helpful to our um, teaching and our interventions that, um, that we've been using at Eaton. I'm very proud to say every single teacher, whether they're a specialist, special ed, classroom teacher, we have all have shared goals around literacy, so we're really working as a team together. Um, we also have Mystic Valley Elder Services, um, and we have currently three um, Mystic Valley readers who come in and they focus on K, grades K, 1, and 2, and they come in and they have kids read to them or they read to children, and it's been just very beneficial in our classrooms. Uh, research says that the only, uh, the best indicator of growth in terms of reading and comprehension is when kids are read to um, or uh, are read with. So we're excited about that. Uh, the district has provided some great professional development around Writer's Workshop. We have Beth Moore, who's been coming in, and Maggie Roberts, um, and they uh, work with two different cohorts, either grades one through three or four or five. And the teachers have given a lot of great feedback um, about that professional development. Um, and we've just been working together. We call it data dives. And most recently, and I'll share some information, we had a kindergarten data dive last week. This was our second round where we really um, did exactly what it sounds like. We really looked at individual students who are struggling learners. What specific skills are they struggling with? What specific interventions are we going to create to support them? Um, and you'll see more of that as we continue on. So this, um, one more cleaner route this time to demonstrate some data here. And so basically this chart shows, um, a request I got last time was comparing the data from last spring to current, um, to 17-18. Uh, and so <coughs> kindergarten um, begins their first Fonts and Pinnell benchmark assessment, assessment in December. And so what that data shows up there is that 59% of our students in December were meeting expectations or better. Because they don't, they weren't here and they didn't take the assessment in the fall 2017, that's why it's a grade box. And then when we move down to grade one, um, last year when these students were kindergartners, 40% of the students scored meeting expectations at the end of the year or better. That same cohort moving forward of students in the fall of 2017 was 67%. And currently, um, that was the January, so there's actually been more growth <coughs> made. So these, I just want to be clear, for first through fifth grade, these numbers are January numbers. 78% um, of the students were meeting uh, the expectations or above grade level. And it continues. So grade two, at the end of last year, 51% of the students were meeting expectations. In the fall, it was 63%. And currently, as of January, it was 82% of our second graders were meeting or exceeding the expectations. Grade three was 66% last spring. Um, coming into the fall, it was 61% of the students. And currently, it's 62%. And I'm gonna talk about that kind of shift um, grade four was 31% as third graders. In the fall of their fourth grade year, it was 47% of the students, and currently 56%. And uh, lastly, fifth graders, last spring, 69% of the students were um, meeting expectations or exceeding. Um, in the fall, it was 63%, and in the winter um, benchmark, it was 68%. Kind of clearly looking at this chart, you can see from grades K to two, 
you can see almost an incline, a steady mm -hmm. incline. And that's where when we talk about it in the simplest form, it's when students are learning how to read. And so by the end of second grade, uh, or not the end of second grade, but winter of second grade, you can see that we're at 82%. And a lot of that work is on a very literal level, kids learning how to read. And then once students enter third grade, that's kind of where a shift happens, where the shift is now uh, reading to learn. Lots of comprehension, higher level thinking, depth of knowledge. And so I think if I had to hypothesize and look at the data and look at the students, and hypothesize that that's a shift for students. And so we take a couple of, not a big dip back, but a little bit of a dip back. Um, and the depth of knowledge increases grades three, four, and five. Um, I added this slide in because this is new data from our data dive from last week. Um, and I have to thank Stacy Cress, our reading specialist, because she pulled this together for me. And basically, um, this chart shows at the same time last year, in 2017, um, we had um, six students exceeding kindergarten expectations. And currently, at the same time this year, we have 21 students. So when we look at those numbers, you can see it's almost like a complete flip-flop from this time last year compared to this time this year. Also, down the bottom is the early literacy inventory, which I'll get into more in a second, but basically the same thing. At this time last year, and that measure is six or more subtests not passed. We had 12 students, or 32% of the kids, were not passing the early literacy inventory. This year, we have four students, or only 7% of our population. So kudos to kindergarten, for sure. This is information regarding the early literacy inventory for kindergarten. So we give this inventory to K and 1 students. So our fall measure, as you can see, there are definitely areas um, that are stronger. So for example, initial sound matching, initial sounds oral. So that's basically taking a picture and matching it with another picture that has the same beginning sound. Um, compared to uh, what's up there, it says HRSW, that's hearing and recording sounds and words. We don't even administer that in the fall of kindergarten because it's a very challenging measure. So basically, you say a sentence to students, they repeat it. You say it to them again, they repeat it. You say it, and then they're supposed to write it out as a sentence. Thinking about what they hear, the beginning sounds, the ending sounds. Um, so you can imagine, at the beginning kindergarten, we're not, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> But we did administer it um, in the winter. We can see 29% of our students were able to be successful with that. Um, so you can see, um, comparing fall to the winter, that we've had some really nice growth. Part of our data dive last week was we took this chart and we broke it into student names for every single category. And then we talked about what are we going to do for students, for example, with uh, lower letter sounds. It seems to be one of the bigger areas of struggle. And so we talked about interventions that we would put in place for those students. And um, part of the data dive was not only the kindergarten teachers, but our reading specialist, Stacy Kress, as well as our Title I coordinator, Allison Ockerbloom. And from the conversation, it wasn't just about intervention blocks and what can we do with kids, but what can we do to support our families in working with the students. And so we came up with every other week for a half hour block, we're going to be inviting families to, of kindergartners to come in and have a little parent partnership training. So whether it be, this is Lexia, this is how you use Lexia, mm -hmm. this is what you should be looking for, or this is how you, when you're reading a book to a, your child, this is some activities you could do, but just really just building everybody's capacity and working together as a team to support our students, which is very, very important to us. So then we give this same assessment in grade one. And as you can see, um, coming in to in the fall, uh, we had some pretty high scores, high percentages. Uh, the hearing and recording sounds and words, of course, was something that is a first grade skill that we need to continue to work on. We knew right away um, the kindergartners coming into first grade, as the other data showed from FMP, they were a little behind. So we knew we had some work to do. Uh, but we dug right in right away. Um, and so basically, at this point, um, every area is at 100% except for that 
one area, but it's part of the curriculum that we're teaching and instructing. So we're going to continue to work on that. Um, I just wanted to share this interesting piece of data. We use Lexia, and we use it in kind of an interesting way. We don't have enough licenses for every single student at Joshua Eaton. So we've allocated the full licenses to kindergarten, grade one, and our special education population. However, uh, on Lexia, every student at Joshua Eaton is able to take the assessment to begin. And then once they take the assessment, it gives a lot of great data to our staff. Lots of our grade two, three, four, and five staff have then taken that data, and you can print the intervention centers right off of Lexia and still do it like teacher to small group. Or some teachers have sent things home to parents to work with kids. So we're utilizing Lexia to its umpteenth power. We're getting everything out of it that we possibly can. This data here, the top bar, shows at the start of the year on the initial assessment, and this is only for the 110 children who are actually using the full program. 44% mm -hmm. of the students um, were below grade level, and 56%, according to Lexia, were on grade level. As of February 15th, 20% of the students now in Lexia are below grade level. 57% of the students are on level, and I think this is 23%. Yeah, just so I can tell I'm getting old, because I can hardly see that. 23% of our kids are above grade level, and that's a shift of 24%. So that was great information for us as well. Some other work um, that we've done, and I can just kind of pass this around, you guys can look at it. So I talked about our staff meeting. So we're really trying to dig deep um, around literacy and ELA, the standards, Fontes and Pinnell, and making connections between all of the tools that we have to teach our students. So as a staff, we got together and um, each staff member has a very thick, it's called the continuum book, and it tells you everything you need to know about every single text gradient level for kids, and to read that whole book would be next to impossible but it has a lot of worthwhile information. So what we did instead was broke the staff up into pairs. Each person on staff got a letter of the alphabet A through Z and took the continuum and some other resources um, and we created our own text characteristics booklet. So I can pass around, you can see as I'm talking about it. And so in this booklet, we basically looked at the skills or the characteristics that change from level to level. And we pulled out those important pieces and made them the highlights of our book. And we talked about the many uses of our own text characteristic booklet. It could be at a parent conference, you're talking to a parent, uh, parent and we're very cautious, and we want to say this again, children are not levels. To say a child, you're a B, that's not um, terminology we use at Joshua Eaton. We say your child's reading behaviors are, are that of a level B, and here's why. And we use this book to say, here are some behaviors that we're seeing. Here are some areas where your child might need some support. You could do this at home. We also use this um, booklet during our SST process. We're talking about kids. OK, they're struggling readers. How are they struggling readers? Um, and also, it helps us to see vertical alignment, or what are, the, what are the skills? How do they build upon one another in reading? Um, and also, uh, we made sure that on each page, the visual on the page is an actual sample from a book at that level. So it gives you like more in-depth opportunity to see. Okay, goal number two, communication. So um, how does Joshua Eaton communicate with its families, its community? Um, we've been working really hard to update our website. If I'm being honest, I'm going to tell you I'm going to probably take the whole thing down this summer and rework it because it's not the easiest thing currently the way it's set up for, for me to personally navigate. But it has a lot of great information on there. We have our school council notes, our minutes, um, information about MCAS, report cards. Um, and sometimes parents will say, hey, you know, I can't find such and such and we direct them and it's um, a great resource. Um, also, um, we have one of our teachers, our first grade teacher, uh, Kelly McQuillan. We've made her our social media director. And so as we take pictures, we send them all to Kelly, and she puts them up on Facebook, along with Miss Quinn and I, the three of us, uh, try to you know show all the excellent things that are happening at Joshua Eaton. And we get lots of responses, and it's uh, lots of likes, and it's really cute. 
Um, if I'm being honest, I have the Twitter handle. I'm not the best. I'm so busy, I look at, and it's making me upset because I love Twitter, but I'm not as active on Twitter as I'd like to be. So that's still a goal of mine to continue doing that. And of course, we have the Jaguar what you can tra uh, Jaguar tracks, which I'll show you a sample of in a minute. Um, our goal is to promote positive news about Joshua Eaton. We actually had Channel 5 came for our Veterans Day assembly. Um, that was exciting. Lots of talk about that. And um, we feel very honored. Um, you, you all probably know him. His name's Dave Maroney from the Chronicle. Like, I can call him and he will come over. I didn't have to call him. He comes over and he gives us good press in the Chronicle. So we're happy with that. Um, and we actually created a bulletin board called um, uh, Joshua Eaton News, Student News. And so we, every time we see one of our students or our families in the paper, we cut it out and we put it on the bulletin board so they can see. And we can all like support the positive community, not just within the walls of Joshua Eaton, but also in the community of Reading itself. Um, supporting parents in their overall understanding of school policies, procedures, and issues through monthly form, the Parent Cafe, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And provide staff training using the Portal Plus. So in September, Kathy Santilli, our elementary tech integration specialist, came and she did a training with our staff, and we're continuing building using the Portal. Um, and then we have actually have a communication plan that I can't take credit for. It was developed before my time, but we reviewed it um, through our school council and approved it and made some slight tweaks. So here's an example of our Joshua Eaton tracks. What I love about the tracks is that it's a, um, a collaboration between so many different people. The PTO, our school nurse, myself, fundraisers that are happening, and we try to make it the go-to station for all of our parents. So they're not going through a bunch of different papers. If they need any information, it's in the tracks. And I try to do most of my communication, unless it's grade level specific, through the tracks as well. And we have two parents, uh, Liliana Stoddard, and I think it said Evie Young. Evie Young. Evie Young. Evie Young. Um, who actually create this every week for us. Amazing. Oh, there's um, our, some of our bulletin boards for school news, where we, the office staff, uh, Joy Pippi and Amy Greco, they put, mount it, and uh, Joy Clark, for that matter, too. They mount it, we put it up there nice, and the kids get a kick out of seeing themselves in the news throughout the school. Um, the Parent Cafe, these are some of the topics that I've presented on. Um, January's blank, because I was here. <laughs> I had to cancel in January. Um, upcoming in March, um, parents have requested some more information about what does the actual MCAS test look like when kids take it. So I'm presenting that um, in two weeks to uh, the Parent Cafe. And our PTO provides coffee and a light snack, and it's, it's fun. We have a good time. And uh, Dr. Doherty came and discussed budget uh, in November. So we have guest speakers as well. The last school improvement goal was around attendance. And so our goal was to uh, decrease the number of students absent 10 or more days. Um, at the end of last year, that amounted to 87 students who were absent from Joshua Eaton 10 or more days, which was a jarring number to see. Um, so we have a lot of different action steps, and I think it's easier if I just show you some examples of things that we've done. So here's an example of our data. Um, and sorry it's not in color, but the longer line is the data from last year's numbers. And so those numbers represent the number of students per month that were absent at least one time. And so you can see the shorter line is actually this year's numbers. And so we're ha you're seeing we have some success. The number is starting to go down. So in January, for example, um, every student was absent one time in general sense. Doesn't mean that like, actually right. every student was absent one time, but if you averaged it out, it averaged mm -hmm. out to every single student at Joshua Eaton last year was out one time in January, and this year it's half of the students, about half. Um, something I think it's important to say, our work around attendance is never punitive. Um, I've had many conversations with parents, it's just educating them on, you know, if kids aren't at school for whatever reason, if they're sick or on vacation, they're still missing instruction during the day. And so I'm happy to say I've had some excellent conversations. I just, I love this parent community, right? Because they're just so like, involved and they really just want to have conver conversations around things. 
Um, and so we have parents now who say, I used to have my child uh, all day for a doctor's appointment, and now they're either dismissed at the very end of the day, or they come in a little tardy. That's excellent. That's what we're looking for. That's what we need. Um, and so students got involved. Our student council created their own skits. I mean, when I say they created their own skits, like they created their own skits from scratch. They recorded them, and then they um, put them on in their all-school assembly. Uh, we had a poster activity where you were just spreading the word. It wasn't a contest. It was just fun. And um, these are just two examples of the posters. But every class has their own unique poster outside about um, many different things, like why coming to school is cool, fun things they do at school. So not necessarily like come to school, you're in trouble sort of thing, but really kind of like we try to have a fun feel um, around it. And um, if you have a chance to come by, they're still posted around the building. Um, and they're quite amazing. Uh, also around attendance, the building leadership team, we did a data dive looking at attendance. We looked at individual classrooms and grades and really discovered um, some different trends in different grade levels. Um, the School Advisory Council also, we talk about attendance, we get uh, lots of different perspectives because of course we have three parents on our school council and three staff members and have some great conversations and I really appreciate the feedback particularly, not that I don't appreciate the feedback from our staff, but the parents have that perspective and to be able to share that and, um, helps us how we roll things out. We talk about attendance in the tracks. Um, for the beginning part of the year I was putting just the average percentage of the month for attendance, and our goal was around 98%. Um, for families whose children have five or more absences, I send a letter um, with, with the law <laughs> just to inform parents. Um, I think that's important to keep parents informed of the regulations. And um, if there seems to be like a trend, I make the phone call to the, to the home. And that's, again, not punitive, but I just want to make sure everything's OK. Maybe they need assistance. Do they need our, to talk to our nurse? You know, is there a transportation is, issue? Or are they away? And we just don't know it. Um, but I take that responsibility very, very firmly. Um, and so, spreading the great work, this is Mr. Magazoo, our new PE teacher. They had dress up day, and they dressed up like Mr. Magazoo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you know, my very first presentation, I talked about uh, Josh Wheaton is looking at the whole child and everything that we try to do is around the whole child. So um, these are just examples of some of the things, um, not all of the things, but just some of the things that we have done at Joshua Eaton. So we had our first ever family fitness night that Mr. Magazoo pulled together, and we had over 75 families come and do like a little workout. It was done in two shifts. The spelling bee um, that was run by Miss um, Quinn and Christine Lusk, our co my co-chair for the school council. We just finished our very successful readathon where students read over 200,000 minutes. <coughs> Amazing. Uh, we had incoming kindergarten presentation where we invited all incoming kindergarten parents from the entire district. And we had about 70 people who attended. Um, and that was pro put on by Mrs. Manna and uh, Mrs. Cornetta, another kindergarten teacher. Um, I, won't be, I won't read through everything. I think I'll jump around a little bit. We had a STEAM assembly for the very first time, and Rachel Hitch, who's one of our PTO parents, brought that in. She and I had a, I was so excited when she said it, because my STEM background. Uh, we brought that uh, group in. It was amazing. Kids were talking about it. I got so many parent emails about, this is the best event ever. Um, and then I can't say enough about our PTO. The Josh Wheaton PTO is amazing. In the Halloween Howell, the Ice Cream Social, the book fairs, and just their all around presence every day to Josh Wheaton to support us and help us with whatever we need is so, is so impressive. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for all of your support and of course to um, the district administration, but particularly to um, the Joshua Eaton teachers. I have to say, like I'm eight months in and I'm loving every second of it. This is such a dedicated group um, who are you know, stretching themselves and pushing themselves and working together and I couldn't possibly ask for anything more. And this is the way we feel about Joshua Eaton. It's a great place to be. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Yes. I guess I just have a general question. Sure. So, I mean, there's a lot of really um, amazing results, and, and maybe there's some 
data that we could ask a few more questions, but more broadly, um, you know, you've got some great, um, great trends, mm -hmm. whether it's attendance or the reading, but, but what do you think the uh, challenges are between now and the end of the year to make sure that those trends keep going the way you want them to go? So I think it continues to be communication. Um, we have at Joshua Eaton grade level meetings. And um, when possible, I try to attend. And even when I don't attend, the teams, the different grade level teams, have become very versed at carrying on our data work and talking about interventions. And so I think we're extremely motivated by the positive results that have been yielded, whether it be attendance or our literacy scores or the writing that's happening or just the general feeling of Joshua Eaton, that that's propelling us to continue to want to do more and more and more. Like, so in this presentation, like, this is exciting, and this is fantastic and good for kids, but we're, we're, we're not done yet. We have a long way to go, and we know that. But I think it's important for us to pause for a minute and recognize all of this great work that this staff has done and the positive effect it's had on children. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sherry. Is that... Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, uh, being uh, an English professor, you can imagine I'm <laughs> salivating over here looking at these results. It's so exciting. And since both of my children are Joshua Eaton, proud Joshua Eaton graduates, I'm very grateful to many of you in the room who taught my children. Um, so looking back at, I have three questions if that's okay. So looking back at the Fontis and Pinnell data, um, so that I think that was slide two probably. So, oops, sorry, okay. okay, so it's, it's so exciting to see where we are in winter. And I'm wondering, the grade three, where we, uh, where it seems there was a dip bet between spring 2017 and fall 2017, and the same in grade five, and then there's some of that, the flatness in those scores. Mm -hmm. So one thing I'm wondering about going from spring into fall is um, <coughs> how much of that might be, I beware the fallacy of the single cause, there's never one cause. Cause, right? right, but um, I wonder how much of that might be summer fade to some degree. Yes, and if um, what can we do? Um, maybe working with the library or something to um, address some of that. Maybe with the recommend. I, I don't. They don't have recommended reading over the summer, do they? It's or it's recommended, suggested, suggested. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if that might be a way to kind of the types of texts we ask mm -hmm. or we recommend to families if that can maybe help um, with some of that summer fade. And then I think related to that, um, I really, this was very interesting to think about going from learning how to read at the beginning to then going into more of the um, reading to learn. And you know, um, so I'm thinking about across the curriculum, uh, what is happening or will be happening? I mean, it's amazing what you've done in eight months, believe me. So what are your plans, I guess, for going forward, looking at how do we introduce that reading of texts across the curriculum and writing to learn across the curriculum? Because the science and the social studies and so forth, is that going to be um, another intentional step it's coming some, up? It's something that we're embedding now and yeah. it's happening. And I think it's important to say, like, um, and I don't have a ton of history before sure. I, yeah. I got here, but I know we're being very intentional about talking mm -hmm. about nonfiction texts at the earlier grades, K through two, um, and really working with students. And they've done, like, I've been through the classrooms and they mm -hmm. have been doing like these little research reports, and so they're really pulling up the factual data and making connections and talking about it with other students. And so we're looking at things more globally. We're also looking at the speaking and listening aspects right. of literacy. Um, and what does that look like? And just trying to get a, a, a broader picture, and not just being about how fast can you read, right? Yeah. It's like kind of bringing in all those pieces. Um, I mean, is it accurate to say that the standards have actually been kind of pushing more towards across the mm -hmm. curriculum, right, in the nonfiction text? Right, texts. at the beginning of yeah. every curriculum standard, yeah. it says, it talks about cross-curricular right. um, connections, right? right? Um, and I long range our goal is to very much get there of but, course yeah but i think for right right now while we're doing some of yep excuse me some of that 
we need to focus on the, the standards um, authentically yep. um, to become masterful at them and then right. how to make those changes as we kind of move along. Great. Now my other one was a little bit around funding. So uh, it, it, I was pained to hear that uh, we didn't have all the materials that we needed and I'm so glad you identified that and you got those. And I don't know enough about uh, why we don't have licenses for Lexia for everybody, but I'm assuming there's a budget component to that. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there are any kinds of, this probably can't be answered tonight, but since it's a Title I school, are there any opportunities for state grant money, or um, what can we do to try to get greater access, if that would be helpful to the children? Yeah, thanks. So the Title I yeah. funding, we have already written the grant for yeah. this year, and it goes to staffing. Yeah. There is a small amount that goes to PD and um, materials, but most of it is a, is a staffing yeah. piece. So it's already written. We can't access right. that funding for something else. Now. Yeah, I, Correct. are there other opportunities you think down the line? There are not other state or federal funding sources. As you remember from the budget process, those sources are mm -hmm. disappearing quickly. Mm -hmm. that, that's quite sad. And we get very little. Yeah, we get very little to begin with. Uh, Thank you. So I don't know if this might be a question from Dr. Dari. A uh, while back uh, when we were just starting to, to do things at Joshua Eaton. We talked about building a almost like a template for all the elementary schools, so everybody was doing the same thing. It, do we have these? I'd be curious, not tonight, obviously, but kind of compare the other middle uh, elementary schools to see where they are. So some of the things that Joshua Eaton is doing, we have not put in place in the other buildings yet. But is that the direction we want to go? Yes, yes absolutely. Okay. So I had some questions about the, um, just the bonus panel. Mm -hmm. uh, so help help me understand something. So the, when we do the parent teachers for our kids, we get it here at, at Birch Meadow, we get a, a worksheet and it has the letters, bonus panel mm -hmm. read, like assesses, benchmarks, yes. mm -hmm. uh, reading. And you had a nice handout here. I hope, I hope people can access that, that if possible. But you passed around a handout that had for every letter A to Z, Yes. Um, what a student can do at that behavior level for mm -hmm. reading, starting from kindergarten all the way up through, I think, sixth, sixth, sixth grade, grade yes. right? And A is the earliest, and people progress to Z, so yes. just to get everybody level set. It wasn't familiar to me until I started reading it. Uh, so here's where the, the my question is. Uh, the, the handout that I got from our school here at Birch Meadow, and I assume it's the same one that we use in all our elementary schools, it just, it has brackets for A through, you know, first kindergarten yes. range, first grade mm -hmm. range, et cetera. Yes. So when I compare those brackets, what is a first grade range, a second grade range, et cetera, and I, it's different than what I see on their website for Faunus Pinellas, right? And so what I see on the website basically is that early on, I think there's four different letters for kindergarten on the website and then six different letters for first grade, which makes sense because people are coming from all kinds of backgrounds into first grade, learning how to read. And then after that, on, on the kind of the, the version on the website, it's three letters per grade. Second, third, fourth, mm -hmm. fifth, sixth, three letters each. I, I found a more permissive standard in in the, the Reading handout. And, and by permissive, I mean even after, and I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but e even after first grade, second, third, fourth, there were more than three letters that were permitted at each grade level. And so what I'm wondering is when we say, and pick any number on our slide here, when we say a student is reading at a grade level, mm -hmm. does that mean that that student to be counted as reading at grade level is reading at at least the lowest level for the bracket in the Reading handout, or that they're reading at the lowest level in the standardized version we see online for Fauna Spinell? Great question. So it can be um, a little bit hard to understand. When you see the different letters and the different charts and they mean different things, it, it's tied to the version of Fonda Spinell administered. So Fonda Spinell has the first edition, the second edition, and the third edition. Joshua Eaton is using the third edition, so we use the most updated chart. So our chart will look a little different because the rigor of the comprehension questions is much higher. The depth of knowledge of the questions is, is I want to say much higher, but slightly higher, elevated. Um, and so 
when looking at the spans of the letters, it's, as you sort of stated, the beginning letters, um, it's early reading. It's not just about the reading piece, it's about can a child look left to right when they're reading? Do they know how to turn the pages? Is the book upside down or is it right side up? So there's a lot of, like I said, behaviors involved. Um, and those tend to come quickly, right? They're easier taught. Um, Lucy Hawkins herself will say, children are rarely at the levels A and B for very long. And if they are, then they need intensive you know, uh, interventions. Um, and so then as you move up the scale, the behaviors become more demanding. The depth of knowledge becomes more demanding. And the context and the text itself become more demanding. And so there's less room for growth. So you can even see it on this chart for grades three, four, and five the rate slows considerably, right? The percentages between the numbers is much less. And that's partly not only the shift of reading to learn, but also digesting all that information and taking it and connecting it to yourself, somebody else, and the entire world. It's kind of the purview of it. Can I ask you one more? Sure. So just a quick pause. So are the the assessments that or the benchmarks that we do on Fonta Spinellis consistent with kind of the latest version of nationally of what anybody using this benchmark, any district in the country. Was. So a student at a letter, if we say, I did, you know, pick a, a grade here, just pick, let's say, grade three, and we say a student is at grade three, mm -hmm. the minimum letter that would be considered grade three in Reading is mm -hmm. the same minimum letter that's grade three anywhere yes. else using the, the same for benchmark. For third edition to third edition, yes. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. So I just want to make sure that's yes. consistent, because I've heard people bring this up, right. and I just wanted to ask the question to make sure we question. could all understand it. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Dust. Yep. Oh, it's yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Carol. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, we were just clarifying that the third edition is at Joshua Eaton. We don't have that for all the other elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just Joshua. And the other elementary schools use a the second, second edition. edition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're People just want to make sure that's that. clear. Yeah. yeah. It's there. All right. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you again for coming again. I'm sorry that you came and your days are long enough. So your efforts and devotion is really appreciated, all of you. Um, thank you. Um, one of my questions is, that, thank you, Mr. Wevin, for those questions, because not having, I'm not really familiar with the Fountainist and, Fount, Fountas and Pinnell yes. program, so it's really helpful learning more. One of the things that I've heard from teachers is um, that sometimes programs come and go, and it's really hard working hard to learn a program and then having it be gone. And one of my questions was just about the longevity of this program. Do you foresee this? Mm -hmm. uh, the sense I got is that this is going to go into other schools mm -hmm. and beyond. It's not going to be here just for a short, t short time, and then we're going to be looking elsewhere. But I just wanted to. Well, this, is, this, this is the gold standard to me. Anyway. We've been fun. using this. Yeah. We've, we've, been, using we've been using this. Mm -hmm. OK. And, and we will be using that. That's we, we've really been using it for question. several years. Yes. And it's here mm -hmm. to stay. Yes. Thank you. Um, and the other thing you mentioned, which I was thrilled to hear you mention, is the Mystic Valley readers. Yes. Because I have heard from people that are the readers going into your classrooms, and they can't say enough about your teachers and about the kids, and they forego going out away during the winter in order to keep their <laughs> their true. commitments. Right. They're so um, wonderful. And, and it gets seniors into our schools, and and one person came up and said, I want to get this into every school, I, and I can find the money across my friends, we all want to do it. And part of my question is coming from, how do you manage this? The management of that kind of a program, bringing people in, training them, because reading to kids is not always the same as it was right, exactly. years and years ago. And, supporting kids in reading is not what it was years and years ago necessarily and so how do you manage doing that training and and support and I don't want to call it disruption but shifting your classrooms mm -hmm. around this program and is this something that you can mentor I don't, are they at other schools? I didn't think they were. It was only Joshua Eaton. I think it's just Joshua Eaton right now. Um, 
So how do you manage it? And do you see down the road being able to man mentor other schools so that we might be able to have these resources? Absolutely. We all, all the elementary friends we love to share with each other. Like We steal each other's ideas all the time and activities that we're doing. So definitely, if that's uh, a want of the element elementary schools, we'll certainly share. In an ironic twist of fate, the um, supervisor for the Mystic Valley Readers is a former colleague of mine. And I didn't even know that. She came to Joshua Eaton to meet with me to talk about um, Mystic Valley Readers. Her name's Linda Cornell. And she actually gets credit for training the Mystic Valley Readers. Mm -hmm. And so we meet, we talk. What are the goals of Joshua Eaton for having Mystic Valley readers come in. Um, she helps set that agenda with the readers. Uh, we actually want more, more, more. Like we're kind of being selfish. We start, last year we had two, this year we, uh, initially we had four, we're down to three, um, but we would love to get more readers uh, into the building because the kids can love when they come in so much too. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're fighting over them. Yeah. <laughs> and the teachers, um, most of the teachers invite the readers in. Like we created a template of a schedule so the readers will come in during an intervention block so they're supporting during that time or during the actual reading block itself. So we have organized it that the readers are not coming in during like like a math block to do reading. Like we try to have everything have a nice flow during our day. The best interest of our kids. <laughs> Thank you. And then my other question was, I love what you're doing with the parents in terms of having coming again at night to support your parents, to give them, help them develop the strategies and tools to support their kids because there's a lot expected of our kids now and this is a mantra of mine and people know it. Um, so I look at your data in kindergarten to first grade and how you go from potentially 24% to 100% when you're talking about concepts of print to kindergarten to first grade and I think that's awesome. Um, how do you manage the expectations of parents around, and I'll include myself in this because I was one of, I when my son didn't read by the end of first grade, I was like, um, you know, what's this? And my teacher, Pam Chomsky Higgins, said, he's got the readiness skills, just back off, let him develop. And the next year he was reading tombs. It was just him being ready. Right. But when I, and, when I, um, my concern is that a couple of years ago there was released um, links to videotapes of what kindergartners and different grades should be able to do at the end of the year. And I looked at, for instance, what a kindergartner should be able to do. And I put on my lens of a parent thinking, oh my God, my kid can't do this. And, and the panic mm -hmm. that if your kid can't do that. Well, at the end of kindergarten, your child might not be able to do it because they're just not ready. Right. And, and the bar has been raised in our kindergartens. So my question is, um, well, part of it's an accolade that you're working with the parents around this. And my question is, how do you support parents who are starting to do that panic thing that I experienced um, around where the bar is for kindergartners now and each grade, actually? Sure. Did that make sense? It does. It makes total sense. Well, our teachers are excellent, so not only are they communicating to parents through newsletters, but those parents who are like feeling that stress, um, from my view, feel very comfortable communicating with the staff and sitting down with teachers, and sometimes I'm part of those conversations. Um, I always, when a parent calls me first, I always say, have you talked to the classroom teacher? There should be your first go-to, and I'm always here to support. Um, and so it is, it is a challenge when you see your child and they're struggling and you're like, what do we need to do, you know, let's go for testing. But what we're trying to do is build a trust with our families to say, let's really dig deep and look at where the concern lies. Let's look and see what skills, and we're doing it anyway through like our data dives, like what actual skills are they struggling with, or not necessarily just academic, but behaviorally as well, and what can we put in place to try first. Let's try those methods because what we really want to do is we want to put interventions in place that adjust behavior, whether it's academic behavior or behavior behavior. Um, so it's a lifelong thing. It isn't just like a quick fix. It isn't, you know, 
always in a small group where sometimes what can tend to happen is you develop this learned dependence. So kids can't really function unless they're in a small group or with an adult, which um, doesn't really serve them in the long run. And so we really are trying to be thoughtful about the things that we're putting in play and we have felt very fortunate that our parents are also like our teammates and are also supporting kids at home. So making that connection like, yes, these are the things that we're doing in our, at Joshua Eaton, but here are some things you can also do at home. And so that's been very, very helpful. So that's why I think we see this growth in our data as well. We're working really, really hard as a staff at Joshua Eaton, but that's only because we're partners with our parents at home as well. Sporowski. Thank you. Um, I just want to say congratulations, uh, really congratulations, and thank you. The work that you've done is, is clearly enormous, and it must be very gratifying to see these kind of results, and certainly very gratifying for us to see them. So great work all the way around. Um, I have a question, a, a brief question on this chart. I want to make sure I'm reading it right. So if I look at grade 1, 40, 67, 78, that's a cohort of students. So In the spring, same. they were mm -hmm. kindergartners. Okay, yes. I wanted to make sure I was reading yes. the chart right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the data that you shared was kindergarten and first grade. And I liked, it. your analysis was extremely helpful as to why there could be a slowing in growth in grades 3, 4, and 5. What data do you use in grades 3, 4, and 5? Because it sounds like that stuff, making inferences, making connections, would be harder to measure. Mm -hmm. So how can you, what data do you use to assess kids reaching those goals? Great question. So obviously we use the Fondus and Pinnell, and within our classrooms, uh, the staff also use running records, where the reading department has made comparable um, depth of knowledge questions that go with the running records. So it's not constantly giving an F and P because that would take a very long time, but these quick snapshots to basically, if you're thinking of a cycle, so we implement an intervention and we start with the modeling, 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 then we relinquish control a little bit where it's kind of a shared partnership, the teacher and the student, and then towards the end it's the student working independently. Then we do what's called a formative assessment to say, how did this intervention work? Did it work? Did, it, did we yield the results we want to see? If it did, okay, great. Then let's continue on and look at the next set of sub skills or maybe that child is like in line or maybe they need more intervention. Um, and so we've dedicated a lot of our staffing adults to K through two because in order, mm. kids need yeah. to have, you know, a yep. solid foundation yeah. in order to grow yep. um, as learners. Um, and that doesn't mean we're ignoring grades three, four, five. They're obviously, um, have their teachers and the reading department works with several students in those grade levels. Um, but it sounds like at that point it's very student specific. This mm -hmm. student needs this. Yes. Um, a question I had as I was listening to this, because these, resu these results are really kind Amazing. of eye-popping. Um, how are you ensuring that the work in literacy, which is so vital and so important, isn't crowding out things like science, social mm -hmm. studies, and so that the curriculum is still really, um, you know, things that aren't being tested are still being taught and kids are getting a well-rounded education? Great question. So our focus in the presentations around literacy, literacy, because that's our goal in our school improvement plan, that certainly, um, I should be really clear, doesn't mean we're ignoring everything else, because we're still having great conversations. So the teachers have grade level meetings, collaborative time during the um, school day meetings, and we're talking about all the content areas. Um, but in order, our first main focus just happens to be literacy for, for right this point in time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay. This is a quick question. So um, we can't be certain of this, but I'm wondering if this um, even more effective work on these early literacy skills means that when the kindergartners and first graders now get into three, four, and five, mm -hmm. if um, we'll see mm -hmm. some of those higher numbers as well, that, that it will filter up. Mm -hmm. That's yes. our hope. Yeah. Yeah. A strong foundation. So, again, turning to this chart, um, what, how many students are being assessed in each grade? Is it 100% of the students that are represented in this graph? So, for I can speak to fall 2017 <coughs> and into 2018, it is 100% of our students, regardless whether they're in general ed or special ed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's and to just a couple follow-up questions. So, meeting expectations. Again, I heard something in response to Jean's question that 
disturbed what I thought was an understanding on my part. Sure. Does that mean that 100% of the kids at each grade receive the FP benchmark assessment and then at least, you know, to, to be in the 78% in grade one who meet expectations, that means that at least 78% of those children in grade one at Joshua Eaton demonstrated a reading behavior at mm -hmm. the, the minimum level grade that F and P third edition would say corresponds yes. to first grade. Is that, yes. did I get that correct? 100% of our students received the F and P um, benchmark. Okay. Yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I think what you're saying, so like for second grade, right, it's J, it starts the beginning of the year. That doesn't mean they've hit J, that means they hit where they're supposed to be for that time of the year. So it's not that they're just within the spectrum, they're where they're supposed to be at that specific level, which is only one letter level. So it's a threshold inquiry. Did the student meet that level of behavior? And exactly. then it's a check. They're in the 78% for first grade, for example, on that chart. And okay. they still might be reading, like you always say, too, books that are below and above. But they, that's, they, they get that benchmark for the phones. No. And then one, one last question. Just You mentioned special ed. Um, when we look at the different subgroups that we have, and it's not just special ed, but there's all different ways of looking at a student population that, that Desi has. When you look at, you know, this is very good that we have 78% and 82%, but it's not 100%, mm -hmm. right? Um, can you speak to how well the students in the various subpopulations are doing, and if you know, what are the subpopulations that you're still working on, on helping bring to the level you'd like to see everyone at? Um, well, let's see. I think on this to make sure I... Yeah. It's a broad the question. Way, you can just start with special ed if you way, want, but yeah, work your way right. out. Yeah. So, um, I can say that um, students who are in our special education population have demonstrated some excellent growth. Um, I would say about, I'm just ballparking it really, like 85 to 90 percent of our special ed students are um, not growing at the same rate, but are growing, um, are growing in their learning and understanding. So it's hard because I don't. I want to be just very careful how I answer the question because I don't want to break any confidences. But um, so, and thinking about all the different subgroups, like we know who the students are who are the the what it would it be twenty two percent. We know who those kids are, okay. and they're from various subgroups. Okay. It's not just all special education. And so those students have also been, for example, in the first grade group, those students have been identified and are 100% receiving uh, tier three interventions. Okay. And not all of those students are on IEPs, but they're getting what they need to be mm. learned. And, and, and that's where I was going with yes. the question, exactly. That, that we've identified that the people that aren't where we would, we would like to see all students, mm -hmm. we provide the resources in a targeted way. And it sounds like you're doing that, which is terrific. And yes. you can look at gender, you can look at low income, you can look at English as a Every. first language, you can look at mm -hmm. special ed, you can look at 504, you can do all kinds of different ways of looking at populations. We have to look at every population to make sure we're not missing a group. Mm -hmm. And, and in the data that you're analyzing, hopefully, will will help you identify right. patterns that require additional resources. So, if you love data, I love data. So, our actual we have what's called a master tracker. So, it has every single student's name and their historical data. And this tracker goes on and on and on. And so, we have filters across the top. So, we make sure that no one's falling through the cracks. That we look at kids in all different ways: male, female, special ed, non-special ed. Uh, ELL population, um, making sure that every student's getting what they specifically need. Great. Yeah. Yes, Jean. Thank you. I have a couple more. Um, one is around report cards and MCAS. So how do you take this work and connect it to report card grades and MCAS scores to see if there's consistency across that or if there isn't consistency? I mean, ideally, you want to see some consistency on those mm -hmm. me different measures. Exactly. So originally, I did have a slide on here because I was asked that question last time about the comparison between MCAS and this information. Mm -hmm. And it's really, if I'm being honest, very um, difficult to qualify and quantify because it's two, they're measuring two completely different things. Mm -hmm. The way that it correlated, let's say um, our measure said 5% of the students were below grade level, then on MCAS it also showed between like a 5 and 8%, so it did correlate that way. Where it gets a little muddy is in the middle, the middle group, right? Because it's not measuring the same information. So, in, and also in terms of the report cards, they're standards-based report cards. and. Um, 
to really look at those, you would need to look at the end of the year because standard-based report cards are on the skills that the students need to master by the end of the year. So um, if you're all in the middle of the year and <coughs> first year, <laughs> I don't really have that answer to that question. But from what I've seen so far from the round of report cards that just went out, um, I didn't see anything that made me say, whoa, when I read all 386 report cards. So, <laughs> wow. well, you have to, right? They're doing great work. It deserves that. Excellent. Excellent. And one last question. Um, and this actually is switching gears a little away from literacy to the work you're doing on attendance, which okay, it great. seems like you're having tremendous success with, which is super. A small concern I have, I imagine for most kids this is fine, but with issues around anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, are you seeing a subpopulation of kids who have high anxiety who now are stressed about, I'm sick and I don't want to miss school mm -hmm. because I don't want to be, feel pressure? You, you, do you know what I mean? Are you running into any? Yeah. yeah. I, it's I a had concern one parent who came with that concern and we sat and we talked about it. Um, and I think it's just about a conversation. Because at Joshua, you are not communicating, you know, you're sick, you need to come to school anyway because we need our numbers high. <laughs> that isn't the conversation we're having. We're having the conversation. And even um, in our tracks, we make sure we state that clearly. So like, we have the attendance, and then right underneath it, it says, however, if you have these categories, you should definitely not come to school because <laughs> the rest of us want to show up the next good, day. Good, good. Um, so that is just a conversation. And par um, I had one parent who brought it up. I met with that child, and the child was actually fine. She said to me, I don't want my mom's make a big deal of this. <laughs> and I said, I you know mom cares about you. We want to just make sure that you're happy and you can feel successful when you come to school every day. We wouldn't want you to come to school sick. Right? In case she was trying to like save face with the principal, you know. <laughs> and I appreciate that in writing because I imagine as a parent, if you're having that debate with your child about like, no, you really shouldn't go to school. If there's something in writing, you can point to and say, see, principal right. says, you know, you have right. this. You should. So right. that's helpful. That's great. That's it. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. So I, uh, with that, um, the chart. Um, I don't need to go back to it, but there wasn't necessarily a goal on the chart. So and I'm, so I just was wondering, you know, is there some goals established, and and do we have goals across the di uh, each elementary? Around for attendance? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. So our attendance is to decrease um, the number of students who are absent 10 or more days. And at the end of last year, it was roughly about 87 students who were absent 10 or more days. Okay. And currently, we're at 12. So oh, okay, team. right, right. It's the, I didn't see it on, there's no goal on this chart. The data, the way the data is presented oh, on the chart, that goal doesn't really translate to that chart. That. You're right, yeah. you know, you're 100%. But the goal correct. is up here. Right? It's up there, yeah. And to answer your question, it's it's school specific. So some schools are, do not have an attendance goal because they don't need to have an they, attendance right, goal. They, right, because they, they've got other things. Right. right. Don't, don't, don't well, fix what's not broken. It's a quick one on attendance. I assume we're tracking the number of students that prorated. I don't know what that is at this point, five or six days. So you mentioned 12 who are under 10. I assume mm -hmm. it's a, yes. not too much of a larger number that are, I don't know, where, if you prorate the number of days in the school year to the number of days we've had so far, I don't know if that's a six or a seven or something around there. Uh, roughly around track. there. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Amy Greco, my secretary, <laughs> every Friday uh, we have a binder that we keep. And she prints me the roster. Yeah. And on the weekend, I take it home with me, and I go student yeah. by student. You're on it. You got it. So the, the broader question I had is, is my actual question here. So you know, we, we've had you know, a long kind of storyline with Joshua Eaton, with this committee, predating me, um, around concerns that were originally related to state assessments. Mm -hmm. And I understand that this is an, an update on the school improvement plan, and mm -hmm. you've done that. You know, we, we've identified in that plan literacy, communication, attendance, and you've addressed each of those. And, and I know that the, the criteria by which that level three occurred, that MCAS 1.0, doesn't exist anymore, right? We have this MCAS 2.0, and we had Park for a year now. Can, can you speak to your confidence that following the school improvement plan is addressing the original causes or concerns that led to the, you know, us having probably this agenda item in the storyline of we were concerned about level three, we formed a working group and I share you were part of that and a lot of other people and here we are some years later, can you just give us some, you know, connect us back to that storyline about how this improvement plan is helping <coughs> our students, you know, address what, whatever concerns that were earlier. So coming in and doing some research and seeing some um, action steps that happened prior to my arrival, um, some great things were already happening at Joshua Eaton. And so um, one of the things that, and looking at the data and the MCAS data and the previous Fontaine's and Pinnell data and talking to staff and talking to parents, um, it seemed like the biggest thing was consistency 
and clarity. And so, especially around literacy. And so that um, proved to be like a number one action step that we needed to first take a break, stop, look at, for example, Faunus and Pinnell. How are we administering the test? Is everyone giving the same version the exact same way, having similar conversations about students? And then secondary to that is the actual uh, curriculum tool that we're using to align with the standards. And so, um, just kind of like we're talking about K2, you need to have that solid base. Well, even in instruction and teaching, you need to have that solid base. Like every teacher needs to understand the standards for their grade level, know where the kids have been and where they're going, and be able to articulate that to create interventions and assessments. I mean, it's just a real, it's really secular. So right? you need to have like all those pieces in play. The hard part, I think, comes in, you know, when you look at one measure, the MCAS test, there, especially right now, um, where it's on computer, does that have something to do with it? You know, you really don't know. The students at Joshua Eaton use computers all the time and um, use them effectively all the time. Or is it a test anxiety? Is it an, exa an anxiety piece? Is it a combination of those things? Um, if I t was to look at the data right now, I feel pretty confident that our students are going to do pretty well um, on the upcoming MCAS. That would be, if I was predicting, that's what I would say. Not just because I'm the principal, but because that's what the data is telling me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that's kind of like the, the best answer I can, I can oh, that's good. give. That's good. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Yes. Just, um, just sort of back to that. So, everything that you just said about literacy, you would also say similar a story about math, because obviously mm -hmm. that was. Um, I'm thinking back to what you know some of the issues were several, mm -hmm. three, four years ago, um, and so it's just we're talking about literacy tonight, but the yes. math, everything, you know, all the same, <clears throat> all content areas. You okay. really have to look at the Massachusetts state standards. That should be where we start all of our thinking and then we grow from there. We really have to understand them, not just as these long statements, but as the sub-skills that are built in to those standards. We really need to understand what is the expectation for certain students in certain grades so that we're not under-teaching and we're not over-teaching, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the difficulty has been that the standards have changed again, right? So they're actually right. called the 2017 standards, right? So, um, and those slight changes seem like they're slight changes, but in certain grade levels, they're actually pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So just kind of keeping up to date with that as well. Dr. Dory, when do they come back out to, with the ratings again? Uh, I know. That um, well, they'll, it'll be based on no, I the know. spring. So next year. Next year. Yep. But it's going to look a lot different. It's it's going to look a lot different than it is now. The whole rating system. The whole system. Mm -hmm. But it's still going to drill down to a level, though, right? I mean, I understand um, the, the it, no, it's no, not necessarily. It's going to be more student specific, like a population of students instead of school specific. Cool. So it's going to look it's going to look much different. Yes. Just a, a fun one at the end here, maybe. The uh, letters to the families with five absences, I give yourself credit on communication for that, too. Oh, like that's great. So staying ahead of problems before they pop up, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great conversation for families. Sure. So. Uh, can you just come up? I just have a couple questions. Sure. Um, you had said you have 100, Alicia Williams, 40 Marlow Lane. Um, you had said you had 110 Lexia licenses. Mm -hmm. How many do you need? How many would you like? 400. <laughs> Can I ask how much you know how much they are per license? Well, Mr. Uh, um, Martin and I, we tried wheel and deal with Lexia, and they, the deal they gave us was it's extremely expensive. And how do you get around the challenges of having 400 kids that need them and 110 students that have them? So we made an adaptation where grades two um, through five actually can give the assessment online and gather that data. And then they have access to what is digital in paper form. And so they've been utilizing the paper forms um, to do interventions with their students and send things home. And then in some classrooms, they have their own little booklet for uh, what I need time. And they'll pull that out. And Okay, it's a great program. I, I really like I it. it. Um, in terms of attendance, does your chart include excused and unexcused and medically disabled? Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. does include those. It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great point. I should state. Um, can I say that? Mm -hmm. uh, we have several 
students, you know, more than one, um, who have um, high medical absences. So that should be noted as well. Okay. Um, and then with the assessment, you have a great, great jump. I love it. It's wonderful <coughs> to see. Was the assessment performed the same way in spring as it was in the fall? Or did anything change? It was the same addition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, cal we did some calibration in the fall, so that might, but from what I was told, it was, you know, given similarly, right? In the, in the spring, they can answer. I wasn't here, so I don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay. They were awesome, so I'm assuming it was great. Okay. <laughs> and then my other question, I guess, is more for the committee or Dr. Doherty. Um, we're a second edition across the district, but we're third edition at JE. Is there a reason why we're third edition at JE and second edition across the district? Funding. Funding. And we, we had limited resources, so we had we put them at Eaton. Okay. It, it, they're very expensive. These kits are very expensive. The and third edition is very expensive. No, I figured. I just was curious. Is there a plan to kind of go to third edition everywhere? Eventually? Ask us after April 4th. <laughs> 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 Wait, will we hopefully get our 150000 a year curriculum funding then we can do this? It's this. Oh, I'm sorry, I just had one more thing. We're having um, a make and take math night, so I'm just going to send out an invitation to all of you to stop by and <laughs> come say hello. Did you have Did you have Sure. I just had one more question for oh, you. Oh, sure. Just, go, just because it doesn't get on TV. Oh, wow, I'm Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how are parents told about their reading levels? Um, the teachers report it out to the parents, either through the pocket report or they have parent conferences all the time. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you all. In a recess, to so yep. you can clear out the room. <laughs>
back to order. We'll start with the personnel report. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have the second quarter personnel report for you guys right. tonight. Um, as I'm sure you've observed, it's uh, much smaller than the first quarter. So um, I like to say that this time of our year is more of our substitute and long-term substitute hiring time. Um, you know, we have a decent amount of leaves throughout the district, so that's really where we're more focusing. Um, as I stated previously, and it's consistent with this uh, quarterly report as well, is that we don't report out on those temporary short-term part-time positions. The focus here is really more on the um, professional employees, quote-unquote, that we've um, the term we've used to describe. So this is our second quarter report um, for dates relevant uh, December 5th through uh, February 26th. Um, if you, I also provided for you the key again. I know that um, we're trying to keep consistent the clarity around what our FTEs mean for various different positions. So you will see that at the very top again, similar to the previous report. Um, so our table one, represents our newly hired uh, employees uh, for those relevant dates that I had just mentioned. Um, so, and then similar to what I had done in the first report, uh, they are broken out again into positions that were budgeted um, and then positions that uh, were new, newly added. Um, I think we had mentioned this before. I did not include it in this. I think, Nick, you had mentioned this previously about the total FTEs. Will this chart add, will these two tables add up to the first? Right. That is correct. That is how they would be. So 3.94 is what you see in our first uh, total FTEs uh, for newly hired employees. Um, if you go to table two for our budgeted positions, um, as you see, there's two power educated positions and a night shift custodial position. Um, 2.38 of the FTEs are located in that chart um, table. And then table three are new positions, which were two newly added positions um, to our RISE preschool, um, are 1.56 of the FTEs. So if that helps lay that out. Yep. Um, and then. Again, we're reporting out on our current open job requisitions. So these are the current op open requisitions for FY18. Um, so, um, and they are currently what we have open for the, um, that are relevant for this um, quarterly report. And then uh, we had one teacher um, resignation that was due to a relocation. So relatively straightforward. Does anyone have any questions about? Yeah. Yes. So are the um, can you you or Mrs. Wilson talk about the um, additional rise positions yep. and then are the open job recs were those budgeted or is one one of those was budgeted and one is was unbudgeted would be my guess. So the open, first off the open, the new position is what, position is what you had asked for. Those were based off of student need um, and IEP mandated. So. This is for the sec, the sub separate okay. classroom okay. Okay. that started in January. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That we had, had explained so to you earlier. Right. The original. Original. They yeah. weren't in the original. They weren't, no. They, they so it's the all three of them, all yes. three of the Correct. Yes. Yes. Which yes. is .78 because it's a weird, the, the, the day. It's the number of hours. It's number of hours. It's not full. Okay. Yep, and then that open rise was also based off of yeah similar, and, and then the high school um, that's the TSP program teacher, which is um, it's not it's vacant. It's a vacant. Yeah, it's a vacancy. It's a budgeted. It's a budgeted yeah, vacancy. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we still need one more person for the subset group. Yes. Yes. And that's hopefully in the works. Yes. As of today. So Let's go quickly. We will see. On the um, open special education therapeutic support program teacher at the high school. Yes. Um, how are we getting services out without that position? With we, that position being vacant? Yep. So I can speak a little bit to that and let me know yeah. if I forget anything um, or if I'm missing yeah. an aspect of it. We do currently have um, a current which is, this is not unheard of, a current paraprofessional who uh, works very closely and was working with this group of students in this population um, who, for the time being, we have uh, moved into supporting that role and has taken over some aspects of, of that. Um, again, you don't see it reported out because 
we are reporting out on these temporary short term um, so that aspect of it is how some of these students are getting that day-to-day -day support I don't know if the there's program anything else is also missing. supported by two licensed yes yep. teachers so we have one vacancy so there is a licensed special education yep. teacher and a paraprofessional who's a sub currently to support those needs we also have a social worker that supports that is dedicated to that program as well um, and we have regular education teachers who teach some of the small group classes up at the high school so thank you that's very helpful yeah. could, could you just um, it's okay. Go ahead. just uh, bring maybe a little um, reminder about what that program is because I'm not sure the therapeutic support program is for students whose primary disability is a social emotional disability and the program at the high school provides anything from a full inclusion program to a partial inclusion to sub separate so it offers a continuum so if students require small group instruction they have access to that or if they're fully included they do that as well so I'd say that mean they would might have a per a teacher or a professional or paraprofessional sort of with them in supporting in the, in the inclusion setting if that's what their IEP calls for um, some students are doing more small group classes um, because that's what their IEPs call for and those classes right now I believe we have two classes that are actually taught the small group is taught by a regular education teacher mm -hmm. but it's small group for the students in the therapeutic support program not other students Okay, thank you. So I couldn't help but notice that of the 12 line items here, and not every line item is the same number of FTE, but of the 12 different positions identified here, eight of them are special ed related. It's two thirds. It's 30% of our budget, but it's two thirds of these hires. Do, do, is that indicative of a higher than normal turnover rate in special ed? I don't think it would, yeah, I don't know if it, are you talking about which chart? I'm sorry. All of them together. So all when, of them when I look together. at all of them, there's a lot I of special I wouldn't say that's un unusual in any sense. Um, I do think what you're seeing is a lot of, the thing with special ed, and Carolyn, correct me, but I mean, it, it is ever changing. So, I mean, we do have additions that are needed. I mean, we do have positions that do shift in we need to support in different ways. Yes. So I think that's why we're seeing a lot of the special education yeah, positions. Three of them are Some of them are new ads. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, so. That's yeah. a small number, 12, but I just want to make sure that. It's really only seven. nine, though, right? Because the three is a. Three, new, are, three are new. Correct. Correct. Three new positions. Correct. Not a turnover yeah. really. Okay, good. So we don't have a concern with. Yeah, no. No. Else? Thank you. We'll go into the this second quarter stout. budget update. Yep. So included within the packet, nothing has changed from the memo that went out yep. for the previous packet. Um, so this update was done as of February 9th using the projections as of that date. We currently are showing a net surplus of approximately $166,000. The update, um, it ha as we've done in the past, we are, we're showing it by call center as well as by category. And for the budget transfer column that you see there, that reflects the budget transfers that were approved at the December 11th school committee meeting. So to highlight a couple of the items within the, to focus on some of the, the cost centers, within the administration cost center, we are showing a slight surplus now. That reflects that we had approved transfers into the administration cost center to get some additional help for the central office. We're still in the process of trying to get that temporary help on board. So we have not utilized all of the funding that we transferred in there. So Jen and I are actively working on that currently with the hope to have some help on board within the next month for that are we are we still getting help from town hall that person that was coming over here that is on the human resources that's hr side. yes oh, we are that HR. person is does continue to be here two days a week and we're continuing to meet to discuss the best ways to utilize that time that he is here so that is still working out for us Within the regular day cost center, 
that one, the majority of that reflects cost savings. That is through um, many different areas. If we have positions that remain open while we're staffing them, we have the salary savings offset by any substitutes, long-term, short-term subs that we have. We also have, as we go throughout the year, if people go on a leave of absence and they end up going on part of it being unpaid. We usually try to be relatively conservative with that because you just don't definitively know if a person could potentially come back sooner or go out longer than they want. So as we're going throughout the year, we're starting to realize some of those savings. Um, as we did last projection, we are we have restored the substitute teacher funding to the original budget levels. We do feel comfortable with those numbers. We have been monitoring it, and we are coming in close to where we had projected in the original budgeted numbers. So we're not so we're comfortable, especially looking towards next year when we did restore the substitute teaching money. Um, we also in here are still including the adding back of the district-wide technology funding that had come out of the original budget. That is a placeholder to the extent we have funding available as we go throughout the year. We would utilize that, but if not, we would take it out of the projection. And also, um, one of the items Dr. Darty and I discussed is doing part of this projection. Correct me if I say this. Um, having done my first Alice drill today, that's now much more familiar. Um, that we do have a placeholder in there in here for ten thousand dollars that is for the classroom safety backpack replacements we are asking all of the schools all of the classrooms to go through their backpacks and assessing what items would need to be replenished at this point so we are looking to the extent we have additional funding available at the end of the year to be able to go through and assess those and replace them as needed Within the special education cost center, we do um, have an additional deficit that we are currently projecting. As we mentioned last time, Carolyn and I work very closely. We meet, I want to say, every two weeks, yeah. two to three weeks. Um, I feel like I don't talk to her every day. <laughs> it's too long. So we have seen an increase in the out-of-district tuition and the associated um, transportations and that is due to changes in student placements um, settlements that have occurred um, within the last several weeks that we are projecting in here we also have had increases in staffing that I will go into and um, Carolyn will definitely mm -hmm. correct me if I don't capture it appropriately within the rise sub separate classroom some of the students we had included the teacher and one paraprofessional in the last update that we did we had discussed that for the budget for next year we had included additional paraprofessionals because we weren't sure the timing of when the students were going to come in and the definitive needs as Jen just mentioned we did add two additional paraprofessionals within the rise preschool that's new in this projection compared to the last projection for those sub separate classrooms mm -hmm. yeah. so there's five if there's five paras it would be three, three paras so we included one, one in the last projection okay. we included three added two. in the budget for next year because okay. we thought that the needs yeah. would be, be much three. later okay, in right. the year yeah. but okay so we've we, added for this year we had said mm -hmm. we had had one yes so the budget FY19 budget we had three yes. teachers and yes. three paras yes. and now we're seeing the need for the two yes. paras now yes. and we're working very closely with Carolyn and Kelly Bosswood to go through the needs of the students mm -hmm. IEPs to make sure we're bringing in the right yes. staffing mm -hmm. the other area that we we are included additional staffing is here is the TS program at Killam where we are doing extended evaluations in-house we did, and Carolyn can yep. I speak much more eloquently yep. to this, where we've done an assessment to determine the cost of doing the 45-day or extended evaluations out of district versus in district, and there is a cost savings to do them in district, but associated with that is additional professional support that we need to do it, so we have included some additional para support, and we will be assessing that throughout the rest yes. of the year, so they're temporary assignments. Yes right now where we're bringing them on based upon the student needs and they would be temporary once the students either go back to 
their original classrooms or further determinations are made. So we've included that staffing are within using, here as well. Are you using staff that are already there just with additional hours or are you it, hiring? It's a combination we have for now as, as we're looking at the needs. We have had some where we're able to increase the hours temporarily for existing paraprofessionals, but we are looking to bring in temporary staffing for the, re the next couple of months as we perform the assessments mm -hmm. to capture that. Yes. So um, I just want to make sure I, I got that. So we're using, we're doing the assessments in to, inside the district with our resources mm -hmm. Because that's less costly than out of district, but where were, were those assessments budgeted um, in this year's budget in some other line item or not? So typically, what can happen is we can do an extended evaluation for any student that's on an IEP, okay. just to give some explanation. So the, the IEP team can determine there are additional questions that they have, and they want to do an extended eval to answer those questions. That extended eval could be done in your home school, that could be done anywhere, or we can utilize a place like Seam Collaborative. Typically, those expenses would be captured in our out-of-district expenses. So what's been happening at Killam is Killam had a lot of students um, over the last two years who have had extended evaluations at various out-of-district placements and Kelly Decato our team chair has been coordinating that work and ultimately has come back and said we can actually do a much better job than what we're doing in these other um, placements and she's worked really closely with the staff at TSP to really hone in their data collection tools and their assessment tools um, in really doing this evaluation in-house so what we've been able to do is have students from our other elementary schools um, come in to um, kill them to ha through this extended evaluation process. So if we were to send those same students to SEAM, it would have cost us $10,000 for that 45-day period. We're able to do that in-house and we're adding, not only are we, it's a much, we, we feel really confident about what we're doing, we think we're getting a better product, we're answering the questions that we really have, because ultimately an, an extended eval should help guide the team with the questions that they still have remaining mm -hmm. about what the student needs to be successful in the least restrictive environment and so by doing this at Killam we're finding that we're better able to identify the needs of those students um, we have students who are remaining at Killam so in November when we were building the budget for next year there were six students in the TSP program at Killam and uh, five of those students were are projected to move on to Coolidge next year we currently have 12 students at Killam right now in the TSP program. And just for and for they're an all already no. The, we have three students having program. extended evaluation of that twelve. Okay. So we have nine students now in the program. It's grown since November to now to nine, and then three of those students we've been doing extended eval. In addition, one of the other challenges, just to make the committee aware, is that Killam is K to five, and so we can only have groupings of no more than forty-eight oh, months. Yeah. And so we're finding now, originally our population was more the fourth and fifth grade, and now we have some younger K-1, 2 students, which is why we need some of the additional staffing as well. Right. It's not just the number, it's also how we need to do our instructional grouping. Is that the Walker report? There was something, was, there was a piece of that I remember we mm -hmm. talked about before. Yeah, so we have to just be mindful of how we're grouping students, what type of instruction they need, um, but overall the... The work that Killam is doing is phenomenal and we need to continue to support that because they're doing a great job at supporting these students. And I will say anecdotally, the, the middle school and meeting with the middle school staff, they're reporting to me the students they're seeing coming in from Killam, it's a different type of student um, from this program uh -huh. um, because of the work that they've been doing. So. You know, it is an added expense, absolutely. But to be able to keep these students within our district and the quality of the data we're able to capture um, is really important um, for us um, to be able to meet the needs of the students. Did you want to continue? So those were the main reasons within the Special Education Cost Center. The district-wide program cost center has not changed since the last projection. Um, we are still projecting about a $28,000 um, 
surplus and again that is all tied to um, salary savings Salaries. mainly through hiring and timing of replacements during the year the facilities cost center the surplus has gone up, up slightly only due to having a couple of our custodians out on extended leaves at the moment so we're monitoring that because we are replacing that with substitutes so we're monitoring that for the timing of when folks will be coming coming back we are at this meeting requesting that the school committee approve that we transfer two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars out of the regular education cost center to the special education cost center to cover the items that we just discussed the increase in out of district tuitions for placements and anticipated placements as well as to cover the additional paraeducational so why don't we take a motion yep. then if there's any additional questions. Okay. We'll move to approve the transfer of 225000 to the Special Education Cost Center from the regular day cost center. Yes. yes. I had, um, two. My memory, the last time we discussed budget was that there was a process which you could apply for an extraordinary aid. Yes. Yep. I was I just should, wondering if I, I had an update that. on so, that. Yeah. We did... Um, submit our request or our desire to proceed with the extraordinary relief yes. I know that the I'm not gonna say voluntary the mandatory trainings are starting this week for it so there were webcasts happening this week I think tomorrow and Wednesday mm -hmm. and then there are in-person trainings happening over the next several weeks that will go walk you through exactly what the process is but we are moving forward with our plans to apply for extraordinary relief that's great does this become part of that Rec this additional it, right now we, since we do not know if we are going to receive the funding we are asking for what we would need for the rest of the year if we do receive that funding and once we know what that amount is right, we right. could but reassess I mean, it but okay. it's but you're and this is part of why we need the ex the yeah. extraordinary yeah. yes yes. Is, that, exactly, yes especially with yeah. the out of district as well as the other right. costs mm -hmm. this will all become part of the claim that we are going through which i'm sure that doesn't go in as a base or right. anything no yeah. no no i just have one more quick yeah. one um so just double check my math if we're looking at a surplus in quotes of 166 at the end of the year that looks to me like we're, we're tracking to 99.6 percent yes. budget yep. utilization which is significantly leaner than typical yes yes okay. especially yeah. given the this time of year, year where we are it is an, an item where um, we're actually meeting again I think next Monday or Tuesday to sort of recast the numbers so we're now almost meeting Mm -hmm. every other week looking at our salary projections in other items to monitor it as we go through. and I know you've been completely transparent about from the time this budget was approved we've been very transparent about the fact that this is very lean we knew it would be mm -hmm. tight my only other question on that is have, have you had communication with our colleagues on the town side because this will impact what we give back to free cash yes. it mm -hmm. will be lower this year yes okay we have Excellent. had those discussions as well as the discussions as we monitor it and approach April town meeting if the numbers yeah yes. change if there's another surprise. we're also working internally we do have um, our own sort of fail-safe mechanisms in place such that if something else were to work in occur we have building based budgets we have some of the district-wide technology so there are other items if we needed to pull back we could but we have had discussions with the town on both sides to say this is how we're trending but oh by the way if things change April town meeting would be an avenue we could go thank you do we have any hope back on the building base budget. yes we do we have um 30%. we do a 30 percent hold back on the building base budget so right now it's about 170 thousand that we're holding back but just remember that we've already cut their budgets this year so we're holding back 30 percent of what we of a reduced of a reduced right. amount so but we have had discussions with the buildings that the timing of the release of that will be a little bit later as we continue to work through it and it may be released in chunks as opposed to all at once we may do a quarter of it and then half of that remainder and then the residual yeah. so I had a question about the um, the portion of the special education 
funds that are going in your memo, according to your memo, to says out of district placements and associated transportation, just a little under 170,000. Mm -hmm. So this is an addition to a transfer that we authorized, I think, at the end of first quarter, December, in December, and that was. I, I had this number in my head of around 220,000 mm -hmm. for the same thing, right? The, uh, was that just transportation? It was mainly transportation as well as consultative services because we were utilizing outside consultants to fill some of the staffing needs. For the psychology. Because we had unfilled positions. Right, okay. So this one, the majority of this is um, out of district mm -hmm. placements and then a small portion for transportation. And so first quarter for us is, is that July, August, September? Or how do we how do we measure it's the quarters and months? Usually September, October, and November, November because July and August there is not a lot of activity. But our fiscal year starts in July, right? Correct. Okay. So and then what months does this transfer cover? So this ideally would hopefully cover us through the remainder of the year, unless there are mm -hmm. other changes that occur in the out of district. But the second Please. quarter, it's a second quarter update. It's a second quarter update, so this gets us through. We pulled all of this information looking at staffing as well of, as well as our out of districts and transportations as of February 9th. Any known looking settlement potential forward. changes forward. Okay. So it goes Good. from February through 9th through June, okay. June 30th, yeah. ideally. So so I guess just the, the, you know the, the punchline for me when I when I add those numbers together to two hundred some thousand before and you know two hundred some thousand now you know I mean we're approaching one percent of our budget it's, it's pretty high and special ed obviously has grown mm -hmm. partly because we're cutting regular day as as the superintendent pointed out in the budget meeting so it's going to be like twenty five to thirty percent and now it's another percent maybe um, is is there a concern like help us understand I, I just have questions about the forecasting process right and I know I know it's always difficult to forecast. Is there anything we can learn from this going forward in terms of the demand for services or the enrollment in services? Is there anything in our existing student population that I mean, we tend to count up IEPs, but they're all individual mm -hmm. needs, and, and, and one IEP is not the same as another, so it's, they're not quantities. So I, I just noticed that it's like 1% of our budget that we're missing by, and I'm just concerned about that, and what have we learned, and how do we get more accurate on our one projections? Of, one of the things I wanted to share with the committee, because um, I had done a little bit of looking back at how we develop this budget, so I wanted to give some transparency in that process. So when we developed this budget, our October 1 count from 2016, okay, so going way back, to 2016 when we originally did this we had 53 students placed out of district so when Gail and I met in November and December to build this budget we had certainty of those 53 that 47 students would be placed out of district so we had budget certainty because the other students we knew were either graduating or aging out um, or moving so we have some students we have to hold on to for a year because there's move-in laws. So we had 47 students that we had budget certainty were going to be out of district. We went back and reviewed our historicals of how many students on average throughout going back to, I have the sheet, FY13, mm -hmm. on average, how many unanticipated placements did we have? So we reviewed all of that information. We built this budget for 55 out of district students. So that was eight placeholders looking at our averages, okay? Mm -hmm. Eight. When we look at our October 1, data that we presented for 2017 we are now at 69 students out of district mm -hmm. so i just want to share that piece of information that when we built this budget we built it based on we felt a number of eight sort of placeholders based on the hit that seems historically good. Mm -hmm. So I need the committee and the community to understand there are things that I, even with the best crystal ball and the best conversations, we, you know, I can share anecdotally, we have students who are placed, we've talked about our students placed in private schools that we have an obligation to serve. We have students that have been referred and now are placed in out of district who would not have been on a team chair's radar, a principal's radar, because they're not students who are currently enrolled in our district. And I think one of the items mm -hmm. we also discussed as we were building it is 
that right balance. So when right. we're looking at our out of district tuition and transportation, not to money the waters even more, mm -hmm. that's part of the accommodated cost. So we want to look at it and say, what do we know sort of fact certain? What do we know historically that we want to be able to put placeholders? But there's that balance of how many placeholders do you want to build into mm -hmm. the accommodated, right. which then comes right off the top right. for the we rest of the operating. So it does become a little bit of a mm -hmm. Balancing, and I will, you know, we review this every, mm -hmm. at least once a month at the beginning, and now it's every two weeks. And in January alone, we had additional out of placements that we did not know about when we did the update mm -hmm. based upon the November data. So it is in the same with the additional staffing. Some of them came out of new IEPs that required one-on-one -on -one powers that we needed to add the hours. So that's why we actually meet every two weeks right. and it's typically for several hours. Right. Several so months. I mean I think that piece the other piece is when yeah. we build in sort of um, budgeting for out of district placement yep. so for those placements we built those eight placements in we kind of use our best guesstimate based on what team chairs are sharing with me historically where we see students being placed but that amount, let's say we budgeted, uh, I mean an easy one is landmark school, let's say 56000 Well, we may not have a student fill that spot, they may be in a placement that costs us 80000 mm -hmm. right? So it's not always a one for one, just because we budget for 55, there each placement costs, right. has a different cost associated with that. Um, so I just wanted the committee to understand some of the rationale that went into building the budget, mm -hmm. that it wasn't done in, you know, we tried, we were conservative, right. but we, we did kind of look at a lot of different factors in making that determination. I think the other piece for you to know is that the majority of the increases we have happened from January of last year moving forward and that's also why a lot of discussion was put into the benefit of adding the temporary para positions mm -hmm. this year versus sending the students to scene for the evaluation mm -hmm. so there was a lot of cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. put into that as well as we feel it's better mm -hmm. for the students but it also is a significant cost savings if we're able to do them in-house as well so there has been a lot of mm -hmm. discussion the TSP, the TSP. Yeah. The TSP. Yeah. yes so uh, on the um, that, that just that TSP in terms of you're talking about how do you yeah. do the forecasting yeah so is this um, this result or the, what you're seeing happening this year is that something that it, it probably, you're, you're, if you looked at past data, you never would have predicted that, right? Never so, that high. Um, then obviously as you, I don't even want to even think about FY20, but you know, obviously um, you know, as you go forward, that's a new piece of data mm -hmm. that is, you know, trends in an entirely different direction. Mm -hmm. One of the items we did for FY19 that we talked about through the budget process is we did include, because having looked back, historically at the increases we've had in paraprofessionals from either RISE or other areas, we did increase the staffing for special mm -hmm. education next year because we are historically seeing each year yeah, whether it's yeah. temporary yeah. or not that we need these additional mm -hmm. paraprofessionals. So as part of next year's budget, we did build in an increase in paraprofessional staffing. The other thing that we've been, that I do periodically is I have the team chairs and the building principals do a special education paraprofessional audit. So when they, they're in the midst of doing that right now, which is basically they're pulling all of their paraprofessional um, schedules and ensuring that those are directly aligned to IEP services. Um, and if they're not, then we need to have some conversations about that because those individuals are um, here to implement IEPs. So so if not every part of their day is to do that, then we have need to have some conversations. So that's work that's happening. We don't want to call it scope creep, but we do yeah. want to make sure that if the need for, if the student's IEP no longer requirement requires it, or I'll make some of the, oh, they go out of district or they go into a different program, yeah. we make sure we are working yeah. with the building principals and the team chairs to sort of cull mm -hmm. that back and mm -hmm. redeploy before we add mm -hmm. additional. Yeah. 
Oh, Jean? just I've asked this question before, but um, because we're discussing it again for people who might be kind of tuning in, I I know you can't speak with any specificity mm -hmm. about where these placements are, but can, mm -hmm. globally, my memory was that we're seeing a lot of social emotional. Yes. Yes. And we definitely have. More. And maybe shift more older students. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I know we can't say more than yes. that. But just for anyone yep. who's curious yep. about why this explosion. Yep. Yes. Yep. 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 And that was the data I think I presented. Um, during the budget process, I shared the placements and also kind of you can see in the budget book, you can see where our district students are, our highest numbers in 11th grade currently. Doesn't mean they went out of district, mm -hmm. I want to be clear, in 11th grade, it's just that that's where the that's where seeing them. concentration is for this year is 11th grade. That's very helpful. And I want to thank you. That, that clarification of how the projections are done was extremely helpful. Okay. So thank I'm you. glad that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just sort of. Oh, uh, go ahead. You first. No, Chuck's just, um, just along. So this discussion. So the audit. You know, and, and looking at where those resources are used. Because um, if you think about, you know, what we're what we're looking to do tonight, we're taking. Um, you know, we're basically removing funds from regular day. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a sense, if we we need to, we if if that power. If that person is supposed to be serving special education mm -hmm. is not, and we're you know, moving that money over to special education, but in reality, if we're finding that if if they're really supporting regular and some of the some of the work that we heard Joshua Eaton right the tier three supports, um, that can't happen number one. But number two, you know we we're moving the money right we're moving resources sort of programmatically away from that regular day support. Mm -hmm. Now we. We obviously we need to do that. We have to be um, we have to be in compliance. We have to meet the plans. We have to provide those services. But I think just if people are listening to this discussion tonight, and they you would understand, you know, from really how you took that through the forecasting and building the budget and the decisions that we have to make. But um, you know, I think that. I, just because we move, just because we move, we're moving the money. This money is not like going out any window. This money is going to uh, very, very specific needs, mm -hmm. and they're not, and they're needs that we did our very best to anticipate and identify when we built these budgets. You know, 18 months before we incurred the, the cost. Part of that also, when we go through the special education budget, we also do very closely monitor any of the. I don't want to say discretionary, but I'm saying mm -hmm. any discretionary spending within, we hold Carolyn and her team to the same mm -hmm. standards we hold the regular day. So if it's not tied to an IEP, that money is on the table as well to be redeployed mm -hmm. to these needs. So we mm -hmm. do, they don't have the hold back concept because they don't have building based budgets, but mm -hmm. there is right. some discretionary mm -hmm. spending in there that we actually do assess each purchase mm -hmm. and if it's not directly tied, mm -hmm. we're holding that funding back as well. And we're, we're tight, but we're not in peril. I mean, you're doing no, a good job. Yeah. Uh, and so we've, got, uh, we've got plans if yeah. we need to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think so. All right, let me try to ask these in a clear way. So you were talking about the forecasting that you did before, mm -hmm. so the, going from the 47 to the 55, right? Mm -hmm. 47 to 55. So when you look then at building the 19 budget, mm -hmm. um, the numbers have gone up since mm -hmm. since the 19 budget. What's the impact going to be? Well, we already, I think, we're clear. We were 130,000 mm -hmm. short, short. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which we communicated from the very beginning. Yeah. So that's where part of the discussion on so the extraordinary relief right could be. A, Typically, we have one year in reserve, so this year's circuit breaker we're using next year, so that would be tied to that as well. So that's right, where right. once we know True. what that funding okay. is, would be a discussion we would have to say, what's the best utilization? And we also uh, build true. that around a 65 percent reimbursement rate yeah. on the circuit breaker. Very so very conservative. That yeah. maybe yeah. we'll get 68, yeah. 70, yeah. and so any little increase is going to help, help. us in that process. Right. But we budgeted that conservatively, uh, but we, I think we're really clear that we already anticipated a deficit. Um, yeah. It, it, it seems like there'll be more of one, though, now, right? Be, a little bit. But I hear what you're saying about the extraordinary relief in the circuit breaker. I, I talked with Senator Lewis the other day, and there they said there's some hope on the state side, too, that 
um, with the extraordinary tax increases that were unanticipated. They're hoping to return some of that to communities. And so I that's know good. each of the various groups are lobbying, lobbying, yeah. and being very vocal about exactly. the impact this is having. Because in discussing with right. other districts, everyone is feeling exactly the pain. yeah. Okay, and then my other question was about the building-based budgets. I certainly um, understand why there's the need for the holdbacks. What is the impact of that, though, on the buildings? And so if, and if we can release the money, it's a little concerning, of course, that sadly it will come closer to the end of the year. Is that, an, it, it, do they need it now? I mean, and I don't know what to do about that. So but it's what they have, they get... 70% of their budgets mm -hmm. they have released to them up front. Yeah. If there are, it would be case by case. Yeah. So if there are specific needs that they need I before see. we can release it, we, we, we talk we about that's it. Something that's really critical. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And we do the same with technology technically because we are now having all technology purchases go through district as opposed to building based budgets okay. every purchase that's coming through is an assessment to say yeah. do you need this right do you now? need it right gotcha. now are there any we do have we're very thankful we're, we have very great PTOs that yeah. have donated a right. lot that are yeah. specific for mm -hmm. so we actually push building based budget principles to say we know you got a donation did you did you utilize your donation yeah. Yeah. first before tapping into it um, that is also I will say where some, the rep funding has been great because a lot of that has been PD focused where we're now they're being very generous with the donations that they're giving to us for specific needs so it right each purchase that comes through is very and, and just so you're aware Sherry the 30 percent traditionally has never been spent until late spring okay and it's it that's always yeah. been done that way and they prepay materials and supplies for the following year that's so very helpful would, thank you the idea would be to release it in may but it yeah. early may versus mid yeah. may we just want to make sure we're being as fiscally I am, yes and i applaud that too because once you let them spend it right well and this isn't something thank you. we're just do, we do this we do we've done it oh yeah we've done this for we've done this for several years building based budgets were lower this yes. year yes yes, yes. So yes. another yes. rub yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah thank you Oh, uh, well, mine is on this topic. Is that okay? It's <laughs> cool. Um, it's also my understanding that's really typical in other districts. Yes, this hold back. This isn't a reading thing. That's very typical in other districts to have a similar mechanism. And the, the rationale for that is the way it works. If you consider your salaries are sort of a given, you can't right. hold back a salary once the people are here. It, it, <laughs> Different area. Um, private sector. Private sector. Don't don't have that leeway. <laughs> um, so really, this is the one main controllable right. expense that we can put a hold on yeah. easier than other areas. So that's why we focus heavily on curriculum, PD, technology, and building based. While equally critical, it is the one area we have the most flexibility on timing mm -hmm. and spend. Thanks. So a couple of things. One is um, a great appreciation to our PTOs, but we don't want to get used to this. Right. We the PTOs, right. it's not their job to be providing no. paper or technology or our needs. We, um, they're amazing to rise to this. And I remember back when Mrs. Webb was PTO president and we had these discussions about not certain things we wouldn't su we wouldn't support because once we did then then they wouldn't get covered by the schools and that put a hardship on families and so we, we sort of blew by that I think unfortunately and we do so typically for and I the way I approach it is if I know there is there is a donation that has come in or I've been informed that there is one coming back where I would say your PTO has told you next month they're giving you X amount for technology but if we're not aware of anything we don't hold up mm -hmm. purchases hoping for it this is more I know some of the PTOs have been very vocal about we have this it's they're getting it through their boards the donation is coming those are where I say okay if if we know it's coming, it's more prudent to utilize that funding since, and many of the PTOs, based, they want you to, they want to know you're getting it and you're spending it in a timely yeah. fashion as well. Yeah, and I'm in no way pointing fingers because we are where we are. I just don't want us 
or or everyone listening to think that this is the solution we should rely on yep. in an ongoing no, we, basis. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then I had a question back to the two questions. Um, the extended evaluations. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten feedback from parents because you're keeping kids in town for these evaluations and we've heard loud and clear that parents want to stay in town. Um, so I didn't know if you were getting I think feedback. that initially the fam families that have been involved in this, you know, are very concerned about their child leaving their home school because um, even that can be very stressful so for our family. To kill them. So we, I think the Killam staff, and I have to give Kelly Picato, Sarah Levesque, and their team the, really the credit have worked so closely with families. I know the last. Um, kind of extended evaluation we went through. The, it was really a positive collaboration um, with the family, the home school, um, and ended very positively. Um, so I think it is a great thing. And, and I think the staff there do recognize also when they can't meet the student needs, but I think their goal is really to do that high quality work for the students here in Reading. Um, and I do applaud them for that. And I applaud them. They have gone out to many out of district placements that serve similar populations and they've you know as as uh, Mrs. Polito said they've kind of stolen some ideas and made those practices. part of what they do to really increase the therapeutic side of their program so mm -hmm. awesome yeah and then my other question and I, I don't know if I'm mixing apples and oranges but you were talking about going the huge increase in numbers mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering and remembering the discussion about the grant uh, responsibility to provide for kids that come into town in private schools mm -hmm. is that part of what's going on that's no. only no. so no. that's no. another no, that's, that's a proportion share and that yeah. comes off our IDEA grant so um, that's that wouldn't where? come out of the operating budget. No, this means any student, I think as I shared, any student who lives in Reading um, has an individual entitlement to services, whether that's receiving speech services or placement in an audit district, whether that student was homeschooled or attending St. John's Prep or Austin Prep. We have a responsibility to that student if they're a student with a disability. So sometimes there are students who have been, their parents have made the choice to place them in a private school for their entire career, and, and we don't know those students, but the parent comes forward that their child has a disability, and we have a responsibility to so provide services. Providing those services at that other school where they uh, are? It really depends where, on the, what is wherever. identified. Wherever. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, depending on what is identified and what the team feels the student needs. So that's where, in terms of, you know, when we talk about projections, I just want the committee and the community to be aware that we have a good sense, generally, of the students we see day to day. But you have to remember there's a greater population of Reading students um, who are not in the Reading Public Schools that we still have uh, an obligation to serve um, from a special education perspective. Um, so I just want to make sure people understand that you know, we're monitoring the kids we see every day in our schools. Um, I meet with our team chairs. I meet with each of them individually every other week to talk about the cases, to see what's going on in buildings. But there are also students who may be homeschooled or, you know, attending a different school. And so those are, the un those are some of the unknowns. Or that may move into our community mm -hmm. from out of state, from in state. Yes. Are we seeing, in your experience, and I know it's mm -hmm. it's new and evolving, yeah. but are you seeing any patterns in social emotional needs coming from private schools with high pressure? Yeah. I guess I. No, I mean that would be really hard for me to make that judgment. You know, yeah. not. And again, it's hard to when you, we don't know those students. Yeah. yeah. But just we're just seeing increased needs. This one. Can I just do we mm -hmm. do we have to provide transportation? for those students, if, for their services. So if, they're, if they need 